and welcome to Talking Bottom. Just Matt Box here because I'm in the edit suite dealing with this interview that's been cut into two parts. I'm going to jump straight back in to Paul Jackson's interview. Paul Jackson, as all of you should know, is the legendary producer and director of many comedies that we all love, including, of course, The Young Ones. And he also did a little bit of work on Bottom, which is why we've had him on the show. But it's relevant for just the Young Ones stuff, isn't it? Anyway going to jump back in to part two of the Paul Jackson interview right now. And were there things you wanted to do as a director that you had to say no to as the producer on the young ones or no because limited because in those days it was so close to nowadays it, you as the director you completely have to go and ask your producer mm. What you can and can't do, and a producer can just overrule you, and, and not even for budgetary reasons, just say we're not doing that. You know, and, uh, I don't want that done. Whereas at that time it was only me, and again we had this thing that Ed talks about with Bottom, where they left us alone. You know, they didn't really know what these shows were or what they were about, mm. but they were big enough and smart enough to say, "But somebody does," mm. and it clearly is something. And as long as it's working. Do I need to know about it? I need to watch it before it yeah. goes out to make sure it's all right. Mm. And indeed, in the case of Filthy Rich and Cat Flap, I need to sit with Ben and Rick. No, just me. Sorry, it was just me. Jim Moyer and I sat and read the six episodes of Filthy Rich and Cat Flap, which included an episode taking the piss out of him personally. <laughs> Jumbo Whiffy, he was called in Filthy Rich and Cat Flap. Oh, is that who that was based on? Jim Moyer. Wow, okay. Uh, and Jim was my <laughs> boss at the time. And so he let the scripts all get written and uh, we were shooting them up in Manchester, but it was a BBC London show. Mm. And I, he said to me, oh, they said, are they, are they okay, Paul? You got all this? And I, I said, yes. He said, um, I suppose I ought to just have a see of them before you start shooting. And I said, oh, really? I was hoping I got away with it. And he said, um, yeah, I think I should. And I said, there is one episode, Jim, where you're quite a big character, really. <laughs> quite big. And he yeah. said, oh, really? Who's playing me? I said, Mel Smith. He said, all oh, right. Uh, I said, you're called Jumbo Whiffy. He said, oh, okay. Um, I definitely think I should read them. And I had this extraordinary experience of sitting in his office with him. And he and I read them, you know, just line for line ping pong and we read the six scripts and he hardly he didn't ask for any changes i don't think what were your first thoughts when you were reading the filthy scripts did you sort of were you conscious of any potential young ones comparisons especially considering who the cast was going to be for it well the the whole idea was obviously the bbc wanted more young ones and, and we'd said no to that yeah and and the boys apart from the 40 towers argument and they'd done the best that they thought they could do it there was the whole argument about you know we wrote that from our student experience and that's not yeah. our lives now and our lives is now in this actually slightly more elevated yeah. area of showbiz than Filthy Rich is set in but you know we're in this showbiz world so we need to write a show about what we now know that was always going to be it clearly Chris the Mike character wasn't part of it but there was this new setup Eddie Monsoon was already an existing character that Adrian was doing and indeed Jennifer was called Ad Adina Monsoon they had a film company yeah. I think called Eddie and Adina Monsoon yeah. and they'd done it in um in comic strip and uh, so Eddie was a kind of existing character. Richie Rich became somewhere between Rick and the real Rick, the young ones, Rick, the real Rick and and uh, Richard Dangerous, mm. somewhere in there. And Eddie was a bit Adrian Dangerous. Yeah. And of course, uh, Ralph, Filthy Ralph was a completely new character, perfect for Nigel. Yeah, yeah. For, I thought Nigel was brilliant. He, he does CD very well, doesn't he? But he does CD very well yeah. indeed. And he just... I, yeah. Oh, yeah. 180 from Neil as well, isn't it? So different. But exactly. Yeah. Whereas Rick, Richie and Eddie are not that far yeah. removed. I mean, they they've said like, themselves that we've been playing the same characters for like 20 odd years. Yes. In, 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 but interesting, in the whole thing with Bottom, then you're into another different. So they did write very cleverly, I think, for particular situations that they had experienced to a certain extent. So something we go over quite a lot in the podcast and we're talking about it is we feel the show Bottom is often overlooked for how well written it is and everyone goes on about uh, the slapstick which just on its own the slapstick is the best slapstick we've ever seen but the pathos and the tragic undercurrent of their lives and stuff like we've uh, backtracked it to like the uh, Waiting for Godot play and stuff they did and it just it was there in all of their work previous to that but would you did you get to see them performing Waiting for Godot at the, the Haymarket the Haymarket Okay. Yeah, it's got some knobby 
fucking critic wrote, uh, please could you remove this vile trash from the hallowed halls of London's Haymarket Theatre, was his review of it. Really? Yeah. Was, it, was his problem with who was playing it then? Because I obviously, would think, I mean, that's yeah. not what he said. but uh, Right, yeah. They were huge fans of Waiting for Godot, you know, it informed yeah. a lot of the relationship between Rick and Aidan. They'd written parodies of it uh, as Coyote. Mm -hmm. They did a play every Friday night in, in uni as Coyote, some written by Ben, some written by them. That's where they'd started writing together. And they were huge students and fans of this stuff and these bloody... They'd always wanted to do Godot and they were very good in it, actually. I agree with you. So on both counts, I think that their slapstick work... I mean, people talk about Vic and Bob and certainly they're, they're excellent as well, but I don't think there's anybody in British television and probably not many, even in the heyday of musical, where slapstick mm. was obviously where the, the slapstick was in, first mm. used by mm. the clowns. I'm not sure any have done it better especially live on stage. You know, I mean, it, 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 when they did it on TV studio, it was pretty well it was live on stage because they just did it. But you watch a 90-minute, two-hour bottom special on stage, they, I mean, they came off, they were dripping with sweat. I mean, the mm. physical effort was comparable to Jagger doing a concert. Or, yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's a massive physical effort. And of course, in the end, that's really why they gave up because they just couldn't <laughs> carry on doing it. So their slapstick timing and abilities are extraordinary. But when they first came up with the idea of Bottom, in the back of my mind, I thought, well, hang on a minute, you know, really Ben wrote, was the driving writer of Young Ones and he wrote Filthy Rich. Yeah. And I'd seen Rick do stand-up sets, but Rick's stand-up never went more than about 20 minutes because... He, he didn't seem to have the ability to write a long stand-up, whereas Ben was writing an hour and, you know, just doing it. He could write it every week. Mm. Uh, and so I thought, well, this is going to be interesting. Uh, and, of course, my really only contribution was to set up the office and pay for them to, to have this office in, at Norgay Television where, where they met and wrote the script. And I remember, and I, they occasionally they'd tell me what they were doing or I'd drop in and say, is it going okay? Do you need anything? So how did that first start? They, they came to you? They came the to project? me and said, uh, we want to do... The new because Filthy Richard happened and for some reason the BBC never repeated it, which I've never quite understood why, but maybe some sort of contractual reasons, I don't know. They said, we don't do that again. Uh, we want to do our own thing, the two of us. It's called Bottom and will you, you know, will you take it to the BBC? And I would, I'd just set up Noel Gay TV and, and more to the point, we just won a contract with BSB as it was at the time, British Satellite Broadcasting, to supply all their entertainment and comedy. And so we were supplying about eight or nine hours a week Wow. to BSB and, and I was in charge of all that and so I said to them look guys I, I'm not going to be able to be hands on with this but presumably Ed you want mm. Ed to do it yeah. Uh, and they said yeah yeah absolutely so I said look I'm very happy to do whatever I can and they said well look we, Dawn and Jenny had discovered just before this when you sit down and try and write a series you need to be disciplined about it you can't just go around the house and have a beer and you know and, and so Dawn and Jenny had come up with this thing of hiring an office and going into the office at 10 mm. o'clock in the morning short break for lunch finish at five o'clock and they thought that was a very good idea and it had worked well and, mm. and so they, that's what they wanted to do and I said well look I have an office at no game we just opened this huge office in Tottenham Court Road it used to be a big boots where all the new station is being built now yeah. it used to be a mm. big brutes and above that we had a huge floor where we were doing all the um all the BSB stuff and they had a very nice office next to mine in fact on the front there and they did that. They came in every morning at 10 and they, they had drinks and coffee and whatever mm -hmm. they wanted and runners would go and get them sandwiches and, and they wrote. And occasionally, most days I'd drop in, say, you OK? Is anything you want? Very occasionally they'd say, we thought about this. Do you think, how would that work? And then eventually I saw a script and I was so delighted because, as you say, the writing is actually really, really good, both dramatic and comic writing. I mean, some really well-structured... And I'm saying that like surprise, you know, I mean, these are bloody comedy <laughs> gods anyway, but they hadn't actually done that before. They'd done Dangerous Brothers was the most sustained yeah. form they'd done. And they were five, seven minute sketches, you know. Mm -hmm. And I was, I just loved the scripts of Bottom. Now, I, I lost touch with it very early. I sold it to Alan Yentob and then I pretty much, I was so deep in with BSB and Ed took it over and ran it. Do you remember how you pitched it to Yentob? I said to Alan, do you want, you know, do you want the next Rick and Aid thing? And of yeah. course he said yes. And I said, OK, it's about two guys down on their luck. You know, it's Rick and Aid when life hasn't gone well for them. They're living in a grotty bed sit uh, and they're at the bottom of the pile. And for that reason, it's called Bottom. And he said, does it have to be called Bottom? And I said, well, I'll ask them, but I think probably yes. And he said, I really would rather it wasn't called Bottom. But, <laughs> but obviously, I want the next Rick and Aid show. 
So I went back and I don't think Aid was even there. I said to Rick, Alan doesn't want it called Bottom. And he said, well, tell him if he doesn't want it called Bottom, it's not going to happen. So the fact he doesn't want it called Bottom is absolutely the reason we have to call it Bottom. <laughs> but tell him it's because it's the bottom of the heap. It's not anything rude. And I don't yeah. know why he would think that. <laughs> and then, of course, the first episode is called Bottom Smells. So. <laughs> yeah, because the original title, I believe, was Your Bottom. Is that I correct? I think there was or? a short time which it was your, which would still have been with an apostrophe, Your Bottom. Mm. I, I suspect it wouldn't have been your bottom it would have been your mm. apostrophe bottom mm. so you know you are the bottom so that's that was the that was the rationale did you feel like the show was a natural sort of progression from the young ones through filthy and then bottom i remember rick in the interview said he he sort of equated it to the young ones was your teens and then filthy was your 20s and then bottom was your 30s when life that's was right. just shit and that's there's right. nothing that's right uh, did you feel like that was the sort of their natural sort of progression uh, well, yes, except Bottom was the untrue one of those because by right. this time, of course, they were married and very successful. And, yeah. Uh, so they weren't living that life at all. But you could see how they'd know what that life was. Hmm. And I don't know, but I do know that they had friends who'd been in drama college yeah. with them at Manchester who weren't doing so well and were living probably something more approximate to that life. And so they knew people, and they knew people from the circuit that hadn't broken big and hmm. were... And kind of, you know, it's like being a sportsman or a musician. Kind of, you get into your early 30s and it's not happened. There has to come a point. You know, Michael Caine famously said, Michael Caine and Terence Stamp living together in Shitty Dig. We, they were both 30th birthday, I think on the same day or very close to each other. If we haven't got a break by our 30th birthday, we will stop. Yeah. And Caine famously got Zulu on the morning of his 30th birthday. So yeah. this kind of thing, you know, of, of it's 30. Yeah. Uh, and so I suspect they knew people who were 32, 33 and still... Mm, and it hasn't quite worked. And there, there are elements of Steptoe and Son in that pilot script of Contest, the Miss World competition. I, think, well, I mean, they loved Gordon Simpson. They, mm. they were always asking me about Ray and Alan, and I think I might have introduced them to them at a, at a BBC party at one point. And I certainly introduced Rick to Lo and Moe, who then went on to write Bastard uh, for him. So, yes, they were, they were great traditionalists. You know, I mean, they know what this thing that they were all just blow it all up and kick it all down the road. Mm. You've got to know... When I was a kid, we were taken round the Dulux wallpaper factory, which used to be down on the Western Avenue as you go out of London towards Oxford. And we were walking around this factory and somebody who was interested, which certainly wasn't me, uh, said, um, how'd, how'd you get in? They said, well, you have to submit work and, and what kind of work? Well, it's draftsmanship, you have to submit. And they said, don't you take, you know, a lot of your wallpaper is, is quite uh, avant-garde, quite modern. And they said, yeah, but if you can't do the draftsmanship, you can't do the avant-garde. You have right. to be able to play yeah. the piano before you can yeah. do the concerto. Yeah. And I think, that was true. You know, they, they didn't blow... The young ones set out to subvert the form, the comic form of the sitcom. Yeah. So that an American writer once said, sitcom's really easy. In the first act, you chase a cat up a tree. The middle four acts in American television are the different characters that we know so well reacting to the cat up the tree in their own individual way. And in the fifth act, the cat walks down the tree of his own accord. Right. And that's an American sitcom. Mm. And they took that and subverted it. So bomb, you know, oh, there's a bomb in the cellar. They all react to the bomb and then the bomb isn't a bomb at all. Yeah. Oil, there's oil in the cellar. Oh, it's not. They've just... So that's kind of what the form was. But they knew the form. They, they, they couldn't subvert it without knowing how it worked. It's that thing of uh, an artist has to be a craftsman first. Precisely. Yeah. Precisely. Yeah. And believe me, they were, you know, don't... I know Ed said this on his broadcast, but can I just add it? They were consummate professionals, those guys, all of them. But, I mean, I worked with Rick and Ed, most... Uh, Nigel, Chris, they never didn't know their lines. Yeah. They turned up, they were... Even when we all had a thick head. And they never came... Never one of them came in and he'd been off on a bender on his own. If we all went on a bender, we were all on a bender. Yeah. But they were there, they were on time... They knew their words. They they listened to what you were saying to them. They knew how to work with props. They they were fearless in in trusting the visual effects guys. They trusted the right people. They put their own ideas where they knew they had to go. They were consummate professionals. I loved loved working with them. The anarchy that they brought to it was was therefore not actually. You have to approach it with a very very hard working head to create that you feeling of anarchy. Do. You yeah. absolutely do. You absolutely do. I'd come off the two Ronnies and. You know, the amazing thing about the two Ronnies, as brilliant as they were, funny enough, I was talking about it last week because of the Ronnie Corbett show on ITV. That was an hour-long show. If we rehearsed 20 hours in a week, I'd be surprised. We did five days rehearsal. I don't think we did four hours any day. I should think maybe 15 mm. hours across the week. Because they literally, you'd sit down on the morning, that's what's going to be in this week's show, and it pretty much stayed. Mm. This is what we're going to do. 
right, we'll learn tonight. You learn that half. OK, we we'll learn this half. Yeah. Come in the next morning. Know all those Wednesday morning, the other half. Know them all. You, they just did it. I'll stand here. You stand yeah. there. Then we'll walk over there. Oh, do we need the music? That'll come in there. Can we go home now? I don't, I don't right. want to stop for lunch. Can we get home? Yeah. Ronnie would get out on the golf course. Um, <laughs> they were just consummate professionals. Yeah. The boys were different. And because they were newer to the medium and having to work harder to understand it, and they would rehearse long and hard. We very often were still there at four or five o'clock in the afternoon, perfecting it. I mean, again, they knew their words. Mm. They were off book. Yeah. You know, this thing with scripts. Very often on a sitcom, you'll see people still with the script at the tech run on the Thursday yeah. afternoon. Yeah. They were off book by the Wednesday. They very seldom needed problems. We did these things called the Italian runs. You know about the Italian runs? What's that? Mm -hmm. So they had this thing. I think they came up with it, or I, I can't remember who came up with it. It's a technique that I don't think anybody does anymore because you can't bully people like this. But So we had a thing where once you were off book, we started off every morning and we finished every afternoon, I think, with an Italian run. Mm -hmm. And an Italian run is you start from the beginning, I'd say Q, and you do the thing as fast as you can. Okay. So you do it, I don't do anything, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. and I'd have to go, uh, door closes, man comes in, and you do it as fast as you can. And if you got it wrong, you had to go back to the beginning. Ah, uh, okay. And so right. the pressure to not get it wrong was extraordinary. Now, they were doing a 35 minute, because we normally shot about 30, but they could do that in 10 or 12 minutes. Mm. But even so, if you were getting near the end and you had to go back, and yeah. it was... But, you know, fights broke out. And right, right. But the pressure of doing that thing, but they always wanted to do it. Come on, do the Italian if, if we tried to break up. No, we haven't done the Italian. That forces everyone to be on their A game because they don't want to be the you, one to... They don't, you don't want to be the one to drop out. You yeah, had to. Yeah. And I think maybe Rick and Aid had done it at uni. Mm. You have to be on your A game because mm. the ignominy of getting it wrong. And occasionally it was me who bloody got it wrong because I'd missed the stage gear yeah. or the scene break or whatever. With regard to the pilot episode of Bottom, do you know why it took a pilot episode in order to get the series made? Or was that just the, that was that just the system of the BBC I'm at the time? I'm pretty sure that, that, that there were two kinds of pilots, or there were in those days. There were the pilots to see weather, mm. and there were the pilots to see how. Okay. So the young one's pilot was the pilot to see weather, and the answer was definitely no. Right. Red Dwarf was a pilot to see how. Okay. And Bottom was a pilot to see how. So we pretty well knew. I mean, if it had been complete disaster, we might have said we don't want to do it. Yeah. But the BBC could have. So it was done separately as the one off. And, and then it's a very handy way of doing it because you learn things and you say, oh, I can change that. And you don't have to immediately go in next week without the time to do anything about it. Mm. And as Ed explains, very often then that pilot episode doesn't go out first because you yeah. learn it's not the best episode. So you hide it in the middle very often. Do you know much about, we've seen some a picture of uh, Rick and Aid from the pilot episode. It's then by the TV and Richie looks at, like Richie, but Eddie's dressed like in a, check shirt and it's sort of it is just so bizarre to not see eddie in the brown it's i think it's jeans and a check shirt and i think that picture went out in the radio there's a, somewhere i've seen a picture of a copy of the radio times uh, with, it in. with that picture in. and we wondered whether that was just a picture from rehearsals and rick were, was in costume and aid wasn't or whether there had been a, a plan that actually eddie it's, eddie had a different costume it's more likely to be the first thing because right, right. eddie was based on eddie monsoon and that was a character that aid was already doing and yeah. inhabited and knew exactly who he was. And Eddie Monsoon would not wear the kind of costume you're yeah. talking about. Okay. So I can, the only thing I can think of is that Ed, Ed had finished work for the night and got changed or something yeah. and was watching something back on the telly with Rick. It's not. And then maybe at that point they're going, right, the photographer's here. We just need you to go in and sit for a few pictures. Or yeah. they were just sitting watching a monitor and somebody snapped them. Yeah. It is the TV in the room, but that could have been easily geared up to be on. But it could have just been waiting for something to happen. So yeah. Yeah, I, I cannot believe that was an intentional costume mm. because Eddie Monsoon came fully formed to sure. the character and Richie Rich did. Uh -huh. uh, not Richie Rich, Richard. Richard. Yeah. What did you think of the series when they went out? I mean, presume, did, uh, did you ever go and see the recordings or did you watch them? I dropped it? in on a couple of recordings uh, on the first series. I'd lost touch more on the second. Yeah. Uh, I, I loved them. I thought they were really good. Uh, and I loved the stage shows when they then extrapolated those stage yeah. shows. Rick was my oldest daughter's godfather and she absolutely adored him. Amy and so we always used to go and see see them when they were on tour normally in, in Oxford was our favorite place to go and so I saw all, all of the of the tours you know they, it was the highest form of mm. of comedy they were brilliant they were absolutely brilliant and you know they get kind of slightly they don't get the credit for the writing they don't get the credit yeah. for the physical skills they I mean there are fan groups like you that know how brilliant it is was there any particular favorite parts you had from the episodes that you saw that you remember do you know 
I'm not the right person to ask because uh, the only one I, rem I remember the uh, Harry Lyme um, carousel wheel thing, just because every comic writer has always wanted to write the Hancock episode where it's you know one person stuck in a room, yeah, and and all comic writers have that thing, but and then Rick and I did their one where they're stuck on the Ferris wheel or whatever it is. And I remember Bottom Smells because obviously that was really important. And although Ed had, Ed knew Alan quite well because Ruby Wax and Alan are quite close. Well, know each other quite well. Close, maybe the wrong way to describe it. Um, and so Ed had very much taken over kind of management of Alan from the moment when I told mm. him it had to be called Bottom. Uh, and I think I'm right that he went, tried to go around and back end me and ask Ed. And I think Ed said the same thing. So, really? um, but he then left Ed alone to get on with it. And yeah. so that first one was really important because I'd sold it. I still yeah. felt connected. Uh, and I remember that episode very vividly. Some of the writing in that episode, I mean, there's just really good Barry Cryer style, boom, boom, that's mm. the joke yeah. punchline. But there's also, there's, there's something, the great comedians, Buster Keaton, I mean, people laugh at me, but Bobby Ball in my mind was one of the truly great comics. I worked with him quite a lot. These sad little, you know, they're not, only funny but they can break your heart in a in a beat of an eye you know mm. there's something about rick not getting laid you know i mean <laughs> apparently so he tells us still at that age still a virgin but it's not really that he's a virgin which in kind of the young ones is kind of a joke you know he's a young lad who pops mm -hmm. about uni and he's a virgin by this time he's early 30s and he's there's just something ineffably sad about it. And, and at the end where he shouts after the uh, woman, and, and, you know, reveal, you know, oh, come around and watch my lingerie catalogue. And, <laughs> yeah. and you just think it's very human and it's very sad. You know, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, he can do that thing that Keaton does to you and that Bobby Ball. And, and he, another example is John Sullivan in, in Only Fools where, where Del Boy has the baby. I don't know if you know that scene. She has the baby and he mm -hmm. takes him out to the window and the moon's shining down on the... And he says all the things that every parent ever thinks yeah. when, you know, you, you're going to have a better life than I am, basically is what mm -hmm. he's saying. And they're very moving. And indeed, Steptoe, king of doing mm -hmm. that. You know, the last the last minute of the first pilot episode of Steptoe? Oh, um, where he's uh, he's trying to pull the he's cart trying himself. trying to leave. And he, and he starts crying. So the, yeah, the, yeah. the whole thing about Steptoe and Son is he can't get away. And yet mm -hmm. he could. He could just walk out the door. But they're locked in this love-hate relationship in this group. And the whole thing about the first episode, which I think is called The Offer, which was a pilot as part of a sitcom, a, a comedy playhouse series. And all through he's going, he's, the story of that episode is he's going, he's loading up the cart, he's going to leave home. And at the very end, the horse is called Hercules. And I think either Hercules is lame or the old man says, you can't have Hercules, he's yeah. mine, there's something. Yeah. Anyway, he goes out to the cart, he's got all his stuff loaded on it. And the old man says, you can't have Hercules. And he says, right, I'm going to go myself. And he picks up the, the shafts and he tries to walk and he can't pull it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're in tears. You're in absolute... And the old man's in the doorway just smiling. Yeah. And he is in tears. You, Harry is in foreground and he's in tears. And it's bloody magic, you know. Mm -hmm. It's absolute yeah. magic. Because it sums up the human condition for so many mm. situations. You know, I can't get out of it. This is, emotional and physical baggage. It, emotional and physical baggage. Back, Literally the, the image the of the physical baggage. That, yeah. you know, they talk about Beckett and waiting for God and so on. It's there. I mean, comedy is not the minor art. You know, it's, and it's that's, there. And that's often the, the basis for a lot of British comedy, isn't it? It's characters trapped together who don't who shouldn't be together or don't want to be together. The odd couple, I call it. Yeah. The, I mean, what's Red Dwarf? Red Dwarf is the odd couple yeah. in space. These two guys who hate each other who can't go away. And, you know, Robert and Doug, are, that's a brilliant writing team at the beginning there. And they say it in the, I can't remember which episode, but it's in the first series where where Lister says to the computer, why did yeah. you could have brought back more, anybody? More conversations yeah. with and, Rimmer than and anyone says, else. And he says, he's the only one who would keep you alive. Yeah, mm. yeah. I brought back Rimmer because he keep you alive. And of course, he's 30 saying, years later, yeah. he's kept him alive. Mm. So that understanding of that mechanism of being trapped, it, um, a friend of mine, a uh, comedy producer, he was trying to explain to a new comedy commissioner at the BBC that had come in and he came back to me, he said, we got trouble, you know, she doesn't understand. And they, I said, how do you know? He said, well, I had to explain to her. She had said about a script, there's no development, there's no story development. And he said, no, because it's comedy. And yeah. she said, what do you mean? He said, and he actually said, well, if there was story development, Harold would have walked out of the yard on the end of the first episode. Yeah. You yeah. don't, comedies, you put the hamster in the cage and you let it run. And I think understanding that is really important. But it gives you tremendous moments. And, of course, really clever uh, writers and comics use it to build the laugh because mm. there's nothing better than a, when you're almost in tears and then they give you the mm. pie. And, of course, you 
burst of release of emotional laughter. And the best comics can do that. And um, that's why they're so important. Mm. Was there a reason in the end credits of both the bottom pilot, I believe, and of the Young Ones episodes that you directed, you never take the director credit. You take the producer credit, but it didn't. It I never says them all. Excuse me, except for two. But but it never says directed. No, by. because in those days it wasn't at the, the BBC. It was a very simple structure. Sitcom, particularly variety, was a bit more. Sitcom was an office of four people: the producer, the production manager, the AFM, and the production assistant. So the producer produced and directed always. Uh, okay. The production manager was the first, the location manager, yeah. the first assistant, the floor manager, the everything. The AFM ran all the dog's body stuff and the production assistant was the script supervisor, timekeeper, edit note keeper and so on. That was the four people and they did it. So you we, never different Graham Muir, Duncan Wood, Dennis Mayne Wilson, all these legendary figures. They only ever took producer credits. Ah, okay. So it was so just it would a say, given, it wouldn't right? say producer, it would yep. say production. Gotcha. Okay. And so I just carried on. It would have yeah. been very uh, kind of impertinent of me to start putting up produced and directed because yep. nobody did. Then what happened was on the second season, was it? Uh, Jeff directed in the second season. Jeff Posner directed a couple. I did, I did yeah. the first six and then by the second one we were setting up another show at the same time as well and it was just getting too much for yeah. me. And Posy was, I was doing a lot with Posy and I said, would you like to do two? And he said, you bloody better. Would. <laughs> so he came in and directed two episodes okay. and on that one, so he got a director credit and I yeah. got production but okay. I directed the other ten. Gotcha. And so uh, I think just uh, our last sort of bottom related question. Um, did, did, you, did you see the film, guest, the film version, Guest House Paradiso? Yes, I did. did. What, what, what did you think of that? I thought, whereas with the stage show, I thought they, this is just as good. This is a brilliant, brilliant piece of comic stagecraft. I thought the movie was a bit, I mean, it was mad, wasn't it? <laughs> but I thought it was a little tiny bit, let's just throw it all at the canvas and get it done. And Yeah. I thought it was a little bit phoned in, to yeah. be absolutely honest. Yeah, we, we, I mean, we talked about it in an episode. We think that the, the, some of the fight, it starts very strongly. The fight scenes in the kitchen are great, but it sort of meanders. And, you know, uh, British comedies that turn into films always have that slight trouble of Do you extending know, to I mean, minutes. even Hancock failed. I mean, Hancock did two or three movies and, and he couldn't make them work, written by Ray and Allen. He couldn't make them work. It's not necessarily, and in fact, I'm trying to think, you may be able to give me an example. It's not necessarily that this half hour thing that you can do 12, 24, 30 of mm. will make one 90 minute mm. yeah. film. You know, again, the dynamic is different. A film does have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Yeah. yeah. And, and it would need some, some it, sort yeah, of. Even when they did the big Christmas specials, you know, they'd go off to Florida yeah. or Portugal, mm. they were nearly always not as good as the. I, th I think the the main example I can think of that have been a success recently was the In Betweeners movies. But yes. Apart from that, no fair dues. Yeah, but fair that's dues. but but you, we remember that because it's a rarity. No, you're that. absolutely right. The In Betweeners movie, I thought I loved the In Betweeners, both the TV and that movie was. But you know, look at the whole thing. They moved it to Australia. They did a whole mm. completely separate entity really yeah, yeah. and very sensible and very smart people they're smart those boys well, there's things like fools and horses they didn't actually do any films of them but there are ones that are tie entirely shot on film like to hull him back and uh, miami yes miami that's a different that's a totally different thing you're talking about the the, the transmission method now rather i guess than so the, yeah but they were longer episodes yeah the, 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 kind the, of an the so-called christmas right? specials which weren't always at christmas sometimes they just did a special rather than sometimes the writer wouldn't have enough for six half hours so he said well like with red dwarf just now where they've done instead of doing a series 13 they did a one-off special promised land the two-parter with the cats mm. and stuff yeah the, that's the right i think it was, yeah. it was a two-parter wasn't it that's mm. right so it was 90 minutes anyway yeah. rather than six half hours because mm. that's what doug wanted to write was film ever a format that interested you or did you always just really want to focus not on really you know i remember one point when i was you know the hot young thing and and a couple of people said to me, do you want to think about... I mean, if we'd made a film, The Young Ones, obviously I'd been devastated not to be involved with it. Mm -hmm. But two things. One, I knew I wasn't as good a director of studio comedy as Ed or studio variety as Jeff. Jeff was a fucking miraculous director of studio entertainment and, and comedy. And Ed is... I mean, Ed to have shot the first series of Young Ones with everything that that involved as almost his first piece of major work is yeah. just ridiculous and I knew I wasn't as good as either of them so I was already moving to more to the production side and and I, I think my only skill really was to be able to 
create an environment where talented people could do what they wanted to do. And I always thought that was my job. I saw... Um, that's the key to a good producer, isn't it, really? That's, that's yeah. what a producer should do. And I saw Ken Russell being interviewed once on Film Night or something like that. And, and they said to him, what does a director do, Ken? And he said, you make the space where the talent can work. Mm. And I remember about 16, 17 <laughs> years I was watching that and, of course, loved all these films because they were all full of naked women, all these films. Yeah. And um, thinking, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to yeah. make the space. And I always felt when I was in a rehearsal room or in a studio... Like I was putting the umbrella around it. Just keep out anybody. I don't want any negativity yeah. here. I don't want anybody with any other ideas. I want. I was reading the weekend a story about a music executive turning up on Montserrat when the Stones were recording an album there and coming in and sitting down and listening to a recording and saying, I just just wonder if you might like to. And Keith said, to, got a knife, stuck it between his legs and said, you don't come in here and tell the fucking Rolling Stones how to write music. <laughs> But yeah, that's right. Don't come in here and tell the other ones how to write. <laughs> You've said previously that you consider yourself a conduit to the talent, getting their work to the audience. Well, Bill Cotton always used to say, like, Bill, my big mentor and hero mm. and dear, dear friend, Bill used to say, just remember, we are the luckiest people in the world. Our job is to mitigate between the greatest talent the country has to offer and the audience that wonder. That's all you have to do. Mm. You have to mitigate between that and that, and that is a privilege and an honour. And Bill used to make sure we all knew that. And recognising that talent, you you really did seem to have the Midas touch in the 1980s with the amount of projects you worked on. Were, were there any acts you regret not working with at the time or pitches you turned down that became successful elsewhere? No, I, don't, I honestly don't think I did turn down any pitches. Became I, what I do regret was inevitable, which was like not producing The Whole of Bottom. Yeah. Not although for very different reasons, I walked out of Saturday Live after the first series because they insisted on putting an executive producer in above me because they were all very rattled about how naughty it had been. And London Weekend, which is where we made it, wouldn't let me... I was the executive producer and Posse and I produced and directed. And they wouldn't let me... They said, no, you've got to have Joe Blow as, mm. as the executive producer. And I said, no, I'm not doing it. And I walked off and then spent two years watching my show, you know doing very well and being very popular and finding more and more talent. What I loved about that show was the talent you could put in every yeah. week. That hurt. Uh, but, you know, I was I was running companies, I was running departments, so... You're certainly very busy. Did you miss working with Rick and Aid, though? I did very much so. And I think, for me, the sad thing that really is about when Rick died, that sadly, sadly for me, having been very close for most of his mm. career, we ended on a slightly duff note and... and uh, that was sad. So his death was a big sadness to me. Mm. Mm. But Rick, of course, you nominated him for his honorary doctorate. I, I Is that did. correct at Exeter well, University? What was, I, I'd been to Exeter and uh, I'd got an on doc a few years earlier. Rick, of course, had this big spread in Devon or Somerset mm. paper. And nothing to do with me, the nomination, the drama department mm. at Exeter had nominated him. Funny enough, because I had gone down there with both Jennifer and Aid. I'd done a drama course for the drama school with Aid, okay. who was brilliant with yeah. the students. And I'd done an evening's masterclass with Jen mm. for them. And I did one with Rick, actually. So I was, I was a visiting professor there for a couple of years, so I was mm. quite connected to them. But it wasn't me, it was the drama department who said he should get an on dark. And then I got a phone call saying, will you do the validation? Will you do the speech? Mm. That was quite an afternoon, I have to tell you. What did it mean to you? Because uh, there's quite the famous uh, video now among Rick fans of him doing the speech. Uh, there. Is it? Is that on video? Yeah. Um, I didn't know that. Uh, it's quite a moving, quite a moving one. Very it moving. talks about wisdom, opportunity, freedom and love and that That's kind of right. thing. But in that, he actually publicly thanks you on stage for, as he says, his life. I just, we just wonder what that, what that meant to you. Rick and I had a very complicated relationship and a very close relationship. And I was desperately fond of him and in awe of his talent. But he was volatile. And particularly after his accident, he was even more volatile. And if he didn't like things, he could get upset and cross. And we we went through ups and downs, and we, but we always stayed together. And, I mean, just a silly example, when he had the big problem with cellmates when Stephen went missing, when he was, he was having to go on the West End every night on a show he, he didn't really like. And yeah. we happened to be recording. He had agreed to do the voice of Toad for me <laughs> in an animated version of Wind in the Willows, which mm. we were making, which is, by the way, a very good animation. Yeah. You should buy it. Rick's brilliant as Toad. Yeah, I've got, I've got yeah. it. He's, yeah. he's wonderful. And I persuaded him to do it. And I was going along to the recordings. And it happened to be this moment when he was having this. I remember him saying to me at that point, he said to me, you're always here, aren't you? Somehow I'm always talking to you when there's big things in my life. He and I had this very good relationship. When he said that, and I remember it very, very well, when he turned around to me and said, thank you for my life, I was nearly in tears. Mm. I mean, he'd had quite a life. And uh, to thank me for it was, was A, not true. 
But, you know, it was such a generous thing. I loved Rick. I really did love him. Mm. And that's why it was all the sadder that at the very end we'd had this silly little problem that I wasn't not talking to him, but we weren't talking yeah. like we always did. At the times that had gone before, obviously, they meant the world to him. He, he thanked you on stage in that speech, and that's what you've got to remember, isn't it? No, no, and I do remember it. Mm. And, and I remember how good he was to Amy. He was lovely with Amy. And, of course, she had this mm. rock star godfather. She yeah. loved it. Incredible. Um, <laughs> and he was really sweet with her. He was a lovely man. After the accident, he was, uh, you know, he had he, he didn't think straight necessarily. Mm. He had no self-editor. Yeah. yeah. Did he Having write been through book, the coma? Yeah. yeah. Had he written his book after the crash? Yeah. 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 You, I, I'm, oh, God, I I'm more, more famous than Hitler. More. Yeah. I couldn't be more of a Rick Mouth fan and I found it unreadable. It was so... Bigger than like, Hitler, better than Christ. Bigger than Hitler, yeah. better than Christ. Yeah. And, and I'm in there as a kind of... He said to me, I hope you like it. He gave me... He said, I hope, I hope it's all right. Wife said... And I read it and it's kind of half true and yet yeah, not, I, yeah. I'm not that character and yet a lot of those things happen. <laughs> and it's a weird, weird book. It's cl Rick's mind, at that, that book gives you an idea what Rick's mind was mm -hmm. like at that stage. It's a you, big stream of consciousness mess. Stream of consciousness yeah. mess, exactly. Loved it though. Loved the, a few of the chapters on the Drop Dead Fred chapter and how he was going to take over America. You and know, all he of these became yeah. better company uh -huh. after the thing because as he, as he grew into his 40s and... You know, he, he became slightly quieter and more mellow and more sensible, I suppose, uh, as we all do. And then after the accident, his self-editor, he became the 18, 19 year old Rick again. He would say mm. what he thought, he'd yeah. do what he... And I remember some very good nights out with him, although he, he could not drink, he could not touch a drink or he'd go mad. Uh, he tried once and he was in a very bad way. He was great fun to be with after that, but yeah. he was also quite embarrassing to be with. You know, he could be very... And indeed... You know, the day he got his degree was a yeah. very touch and go day, yeah. and that was after he was at his accident. Is there anyone on on TV now that sort of reminds you of of Rick and Aid, or you know, I, I think even if it's in the same spirit, that kind I of think thing. a lot of people at the time it became a bit of a curse because a lot of comics, including Aid himself, would say, "I can't do that. That's Rick. I can't." He became so dominant mm. that people were unwittingly doing Rickisms, yeah. and and it became a it became a difficulty in a way. I don't think, you know, there's no second Tommy Cooper. There's there's no second mm. Ronnie Corbett. I don't think there's another Rick. No, yeah. I don't. And there and they never will be. You can't. You, you I can't, don't think so. Yeah. No. no, I don't think uh, so. People sure. like people like that are unique. The David Bowie yeah. types. That where it's well, just, you, you can't right. find I mean, you, them. You can have other people. They bring a unique worldview. Mm. That's the point. They see the world differently. They are an old friend of mine said to me when I was quite a young producer, I was quite a young producer and I was working with Little and Large and I'd asked them round to my house to watch the FA Cup final. They happened to be in London. They were pissed off that they couldn't go home and watch it at home because we were in the studio the next day. I said, come to our house and watch it. And they came and I mentioned this to my boss at the time, Jim Moore, who we just talked about. And Jim said, that's great, Paul. He said, but I tell you one thing, never mistake the talent for personal friends. Right. He said, they are different from us. They run on different fuel. And that's incredibly good advice. And Rick did become a personal friend and Ben did and to a lesser extent Aid and certainly Ed and Ruby. And, but they do run on different fuel. And, and the ones who are really the driven, the really special ones, they're touched. You know, they're, 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 they're touched by God or the mm. stars or whatever, stardust, whatever. They're not, they're not the same. Mm. And therefore you can't quite relate to them like you can another, another ordinary mm -hmm. person. Yeah. You have a very extensive and impressive CV, working as an executive and a producer and a director. If someone had to say, what is the one thing that you are the proudest of? What one piece of work would you well, hold Well, you need know, to do the cliched answer, but it is now true now in my 70s, is my, is my kids. So, yeah. you, I mean, that's by far, you suddenly realise what that other stuff was all a load of noise. But, uh, but the one thing in my professional career is comic relief. So, yeah. um, uh, it's not actually when a show. I was young, when I was little, not, well, so 18 or so, I booked off... A day of work once I'm like oh I'll miss comic relief fuck that right I loved it so and the young ones were Cliff Richard stuff I bought the, the mm -hmm. tape well that was the first thing, one so, we yeah did. and well to me I was kind of vaguely familiar with who Cliff Richard was but it was I learned about Cliff Richard for the young ones stuff and seeing him on that yeah the the, uh, the comic relief early stuff that was there well it had all that it was. Comic it wasn't just oh, and some comics coming on and doing a bit. It no, was the was same Richard, level. It was Richard and Jane Dewson drove that show to be the show it is, and I get so irritated nowadays with people talking about white saviorism and and you know inappropriate uh, interaction with with uh, rural African communities and all that bollocks. The fact is, they've raised one point seven billion pounds. Mm. Mm. You are never in the UK, and it's not a UK charity. In the UK, you're never more than eight miles from a comic relief 
uh, funded project. Comic Relief has done such an amount of good in this world, and I chaired it for the first 12 years. And that's the proudest thing in my life, no, mm. no question about it. And I had some extraordinary experiences in Africa and in England with, with Jane, because Jane, in, so in the same way, Richard said, if you're going to come and do Comic Relief, you write a new piece of work and you write the best piece of work you can write at this moment. I don't want the bottom drawer because it's for charity, which had kind of become mm. the thing, the Royal Variety, you know, people went on, they're not going to do their yeah. 10 minutes of current yeah. material. They did five minutes from a year ago mm. uh, because you're not going to have it watched by 20 million people. So, mm. and Richard said, no, you do your best work. And Jane said, and you understand, Jane, in the end, it got too busy, but she wanted people to go to the projects to meet the people, to understand why they were doing it. And, you know, we tried to do it when I was in Australia, Richard, and some of the team, Kevin, people came down to Australia and Channel 9 tried to do it. And it, and I remember sitting in the meeting where it was all right, we're going to do it. This is brilliant, we're going to do it. And I said, hang on a minute, guys, just before we break up, who are we doing it for? Mm. And they said, oh, whoever, yeah, you, whoever you want to do it. And I'm, no, 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 no. Mm. You have to, if you don't understand why you're doing it, it won't work. There yeah. has to be a reason. And people were so passionate about Band-Aid before it and, and Comic Relief about why they were doing it. And, and of course, in Australia, they weren't passionate about it and it never got properly assigned what they were doing it for and it didn't work. I hope this isn't too much of a screeching uh, gear change. It's quite well known that there's a US version, mm. that, a pilot that was made mm. of the young ones, uh, called Oh No, Not Them. We were wondering who we had to sleep with in order to get a look at a copy of it. <laughs> Do you know, I'm not sure. I wish I could get a copy of it. Um, I can't think who would have it, to be honest. It was made by the Mary Tyler Moore Company. Mm. So who bought the rights from who? So the Mary Tyler Moore Company which was an American production company run by the famous comedian, must have brought the rights from the BBC. Wouldn't have been from Rick and Ben and Aid. BBC would have owned the rights. They would have sold them the remake rights. I don't think Nigel was cast because they couldn't find yeah. anybody to cast as Neil, so they cast Nigel. They did ask me. They were quite well on it. And I think TVS, for some reason, had some connection to Mary Tyler Moore. So I got a phone call from a mate of mine at TVS, an ex-BBC friend called Alan Boyd, who said... Look, my colleagues in America on the Mary Tyler Moore show, they can't, in fact, they, they've bought it and they're trying to make it and they don't understand it. They've got a few questions for you. Could you help them with mm. it? And I said, yeah, of course. And one of the questions was, who's the good guy? Yeah. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, you know, sitcom, you've got to have somebody to root for. You've got to have somebody to love. And I said, no, the whole point is you hate them all. They're all idiots. The least idiotic <laughs> is Neil in an ascending order, yeah. you know, the least unlikable. is, the, But no, you don't love anything. They're all idiots. They're mm. all freaks. And they couldn't understand that at all. Do you think that's why some US translations of British shows flop? And others, I think it's very yeah. difficult to do. You know, I mean, Red Dwarf didn't work as a pilot. I thought, uh, I thought it was interesting that both Young Ones and Red Dwarf had the same thing of, it's essentially a four-piece uh, show. And in both instances, they had to take one member of the UK yes. cast over to try and replicate it whilst recasting the other three. That was a bit of an odd. Well, and I think possibly the assumption that they didn't need the other three was 14. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you another example of it, completely different, but it makes the point. I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, has been tried in several countries. It worked for a short time in Germany. The reason it doesn't work anywhere else is because you haven't got Ant and Deck. Mm. I'm a celebrity, is a great show. I love that show. But without Ant and Deck, that's what makes the show work. Yeah. And you can't just put two you know, random, because it's unique what they yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. Well, how do you think Rick and Aid would have done in that Anna and Deck well, role? I, I, do you think that would... A on parallel, young ones? No, no, in a parallel universe <laughs> with um, reality TV, instead of Anna and Deck, it's Rick and Aid doing well, Rick and Well, they'd have been a lot more cynical about it. I mean, Anna and Deck are... Well, I love those two boys. They're the nicest men and talented, so talented. But they very gently undermine the whole thing. They just mm. very gently say, what can you <laughs> what did he just say Rick and Aid would have just said you know <laughs> they'd have been far more cynical yeah. far harsher yeah. they really are so the they, every man aren't they Ant and Deck and they wouldn't you. have done it for 12 yeah. years 20 years because they'd get bored well before that <laughs> Ant and Deck are prepared to listen to people and take on yeah, their and Deck are stories pretty, and pretty much know what they're doing but mm -hmm. they trust their team they've got a brilliant mm -hmm. team that's been around them Chris Power the director and the whole production team have been around them since the very beginning so they know that those mm -hmm. guys create the stories overnight every night yeah and feed them to them and they totally trust them. They have a very good team of writers who they totally trust. 
there's there's a sitcom that we wanted to ask you a little bit about that uh, we've mentioned once or twice we've talked about <laughs> once or twice on the podcast which is we wondered how the sitcom Heil Honey I'm Home <laughs> was was pitched to you uh, and whether it's true that all whether the, the, a series was filmed but only one episode was broadcast so what happened was we had this BSB contract with British Satellite Broadcasting and we were making eight or ten hours a week for them off comedy and entertainment they'd been on the air for maybe a year good old friend of mine called John Gow was the controller of programs there and he said to me after about nine months or a year he said Paul it's lovely we're all doing very well I want to recommission all the shows but we're at the point now where we need to make a noise we need to we need to get some publicity have you got anything you know comedy is very often good for doing that have you got anything that you think Mike cousin I said well <laughs> said, there is this mad writer called Jeff Atkinson we did worked with Jeff a lot yeah and I knew he had this script I hadn't read it but I knew he had this script and I said he's got this script called Hi Honey I'm Home which is a, a 50s American sitcom version of Adolf and Eva living next door to a Jewish couple and John <laughs> said well that sounds interesting can I have a look so I went to Jeff and said you know what do you think and he said oh god he was he was a, a, so apostolic about this show Jeff he'd always he, anybody would stop he'd say this show it really was you know they discover it in the vaults of a 50s thing it's not anti-Semitic it's not praising Hitler anyway I showed to John John said yes okay let's have a go so we commissioned the I think 13 scripts I think 13 got a writer over from America to co-write with Jeff I think it was again a how-to pilot rather than a what-if pilot I don't think there was ever any doubt we were going to do it Uh, and we made the pilot and we very quickly went into production (laughs) what's the studio where they make Hammer House of Horror which was appropriate you know that oh um, was that in in Ealing Ealing. no no it's out a little bit further out I can't remember what it's called but you know that gothic thing that's actually on that is is a building on the studio so it was you know if you're going to do a dark and we we were in the Hammer Horror studio yeah and we started to shoot them. We shot about six or seven when Sky bought BSB. And another friend of mine, David Elstein, was the controller of programs at Sky. And he phoned me up the morning, I think, they bought it and said, Paul, we need a meeting. And I said, yeah. He said, just tell me very quickly this Hal Honey thing. And I said, yeah. He said, stop, stop it now. <laughs> and I said, what, literally, you don't want this one this week shot? And he said, no, stop it. We're never going to show it, so stop it. <laughs> and I said, you won't save much money. You know, he said, stop it. So I had to go up to, I had to drive up to... I was, can't remember the place did you uh, and tell them all I'm really sorry and given the pain that we'd gone through to get that far yeah. it, was a, it was a very very difficult shoot I'm pretty sure I can't swear to, we never got to editing more than the first one we did the first right. one to show the executives and the rest we were kind of rough assembling but we were going yeah. to edit it all at the end and I think that all those tapes were sequestered by by Sky who said right oh, you know really? just give us all the material yeah all the scripts everything because they owned it yeah yeah mm-hmm. And just bury it, and hopefully no one. And nobody years later it again. And I suspect nearly everything was buried. But this, there was a master tape of the first completed show. Yeah. And my business partner at the time at Norgay was a man called Charles Armitage, and Charles said that he had got that tape and locked it in a vault. Uh, but he'd kept the master tape. He hadn't given it to Sky, mm. and he'd kept it and locked it in the vault, and it was never going to be seen ever again. I believe that story, and I occasionally told it, or it come up, or I was doing a public thing and again mm. I was at Banff one year there's a big there's a big TV festival in Banff every summer and I was at Banff and somebody asked me the question I was telling this story and somebody said no it's on YouTube yeah. <laughs> so I said what he said it's on YouTube and he, yeah yeah and I said what well, I just absolutely pissed my pants I don't know what that is extra- the whole episode he said yeah so people said oh can we see it can we see it and he left it running on on the um he said yeah you can watch it so I went I think I might have stayed and watched it. It's a big group of industry professionals. And at the end, everybody said, well, what was wrong? You know, mm. you were just too early. This was maybe 10, 15 years mm, after. Yeah. You were just too early. There's nothing. It's just completely sure. inoffensive. Yeah. But there was, was, I mean, there were questions in the Houses of Parliament. I mean, Greville Jenner <laughs> got incredibly exercised about it. He was leader of the Board of Jewish Deputies at the time. Yeah. Um, it, look, it was probably a stupid thing to do. Uh, well, you say that, but I think you were right in that it was ahead of its time and that now mm. there's um, uh, Jojo Rabbit, you know. With well, Jojo Rabbit is, and, and, and the producers, you know, the producer yeah. one of my favourite movies. And Springtime for Hitler is a pretty full on, you know, yeah. but Mel Brooks is Jewish and, and Zero's Jewish. And so, you know, it's a different, Gene's Jewish. So it's a different thing. I probably on balance wish we'd never done it. Um, right, and I know that Maria Friedman, for example, was really upset about doing it, and we almost had to kind of hold her a contract and yeah. persuade her to do it. She really didn't want to carry on with it after a certain point, and I know 
uh, Alfred Marx's son, whose first name I can't remember, who who, who played uh, the next door neighbour. It, it wasn't the funnest thing to be doing because we were getting this vitriolic. I mean, we were getting um, feces through letterboxes. And, oh God, and really? It was really yeah. The the uh, American guy who was in England working with us, he had a bomb uh, attempted planted on his uh, in his house in LA through his letterbox or in his garage or yeah. something in LA. It was. It was very, very nasty stuff. Yeah. So it was just beyond a, que a question of what's poor taste. Well, yes, because, was... you know, the, as with all these mm -hmm. things, nobody's seen it. Mm. It was just you're making a comedy about mm -hmm. Hitler, mm -hmm. treating Hitler as a comic character. Mm -hmm. And, of course, I mean, never mind anybody else, Charlie Chaplin, you know. The, yeah. I mean, the yeah. whole point is laugh at the idiot. But on balance, and I remember Bill Cotton, who, you know, my, my dear friend, looking at me and saying, did we have to do this, Paul? Did we have to get into yeah. this? Couldn't we have seen this coming? And I thought, I've let him down and... Jeff is still absolutely, once it's shown, so you can see it's not what people think it is and blah, blah, blah. But you can see it on YouTube if you want to see it. Is there anything on TV at the moment that excites you? You know, I've got to be honest, I don't watch a lot of TV okay. anymore. The Hannah Gadsby, Nanette, I thought that was a stunning piece of writing and performance. I was abs it's a long time, what's four years ago now, maybe 17, 18. I saw it a bit late, I didn't hear about it until a bit late. And I sat down to watch it. And she came out and she's everything that I'm not immediately right on lesbian proselytizing. This is my comedy. This is who I am. T -t Take it or suck it up or leave it. And I sat there gobsmacked by her talent and by her stagecraft and by the writing and by the way that she forced me to see the world from her point of view. I was mm. moved. I was in tears. I was laughing. That is the most recent piece of work to make me remember why comedy is important. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean, there's still a place for dark comedy, shock humour, poor taste, bad taste, as long as it's done well. You've said previously you've just got to find the funny. And that, that changes over the years, doesn't it? But it, inherently, what we find funny... Find the funny was a, necessarily... was, it was a... Necessarily. It was a name that I used to use for a lecture. When I, when I retired, I did mm. the lecture quite a bit. And I did a one lecture called Find the Funny. Mm. Follow the funny, follow the funny. Mm -hmm. I do believe that. And, and the example that I use in that lecture was uh, there was a famous occasion when Angus Deaton was still hosting Have I Got News? And he was caught mm -hmm. in flagrante in a, in a villa in Italy by the News of the World mm -hmm. with prostitutes, with cocaine, while Lisa, Lisa, Lisa it was actually, uh, was asleep in the next bedroom. And he was absolutely caught with his pants down. And there were about two more episodes of Have I Got News to be recorded. Of course, they were recorded on Thursday, went out on Friday. And the BBC said to Jimmy Marvel, who's another man who I hugely, hugely admire, genius of, of the comedy world, who runs Hattrick and runs that show. And the BBC said to Jimmy, do you not want to do it this week? You know, I mean, it's going to be really difficult. Do you want to replace him? What do you want to do? And Jimmy went to Angus, apparently, and said, do you not want to do it this week? And, and Angus said, no, of course I've got to do it this week. I can't spend the last five years taking the piss out of anybody who walks vaguely within, you know, and then say, I can't take it myself. I've got to do it. And Jimmy went back to BBC and said, no, we'll do it. And they said, will you mention it? And he said, well, of course we'll mention it. I mean, well, how can we not mention it? And if you see that, it's on YouTube. Yeah, you see I the first seven that. or eight yeah. minutes. They yeah. rip mm -hmm. him asunder. They literally, brilliant, funny, I laugh think, out loud. Is that where Paul Merton reveals he's got the, he's had the news of the world? Yeah. Yes, and he gets the news of the world the headline out. headline on, and, yeah. You, yeah. I suppose you were taking it on the chin, were you? You were taking it on the chin. No, it must have been, yeah, I mean, it just, it's brilliant. And Angus sits there and takes it and tries to make the odd funny joke. And uh, it's just brilliant. And that, to me, sums it up. You know, you just got to go with what the funny is. Yeah. You can't not do it because it's awkward or you didn't want to or he's your mate or you've just got to do it. And and Jimmy is already one of my heroes and he made that decision. Angus made that decision. It hurt him terribly for years afterwards. Paul and Ian, absolutely, there was no choice for them. They had to do what they do. Mm. And they all made the right decision and they made a very, very funny eight or nine minutes of compelling, brilliant, witty television mm. by standing by the funny. Can I ask one, one last question? As the producer, usually people are behind the scenes. Do you get recognised often uh, or much at all? I, not really. I used to a tiny bit because, A, a lot of people had come to the shows, you know, fans, had, so they saw me around at the shows. And I, at one time there were a lot of shows being made on television about these shows mm. when we were doing Saturday Live there was an omnibus made about it there was yeah. endless shows about alternative comedy and so on I did a, several series of radio shows which you don't see but you hear yeah. about it you're in picture publicity and so on so I used to a little bit I don't anymore mm. people don't even know what the shows are anymore but um, 
Yes, I did a little bit, but not much. I can speak for all of us when I say that your name will, has always been recognisable to us as uh, one of those names of several that would always appear on the ends of our favourite shows during our formative years. So thank you very much for, for everything you've done. Well, you know, as I say, I, I'm such a passionate believer in the power and the importance of comedy. And when you hear, when you find people like yourselves who are so dedicated to the art, really, I don't care where it's my show or John Lowe's show or Bob Spears' show, but you clearly put so much effort into it. You know it, you understand it, you understand why it's important. That's the point of doing it. You know, it was great fun and we got paid and we had a great time. But the point of doing it is so that people listen to it and watch it and say, I get it. Yeah, OK, mm. I get that. It's good that you've, that. yeah, your attitude with that, it's, it's nice not to be smug about it, but you should mm. be aware of how important you've shaped comedy. Com comedy is and not I didn't it's well not you did a fair amount but, right but you're not you, nothing but you have to if comedy weren't so important it wouldn't have mattered what I'd done with it mm. you know the point is it's comedy that's important mm. and and it so often gets dismissed as the kind of the red nose the, the, yeah. the low heel the the, the 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 end of the pier bit of it you know yeah, and, and yeah. Olivier is the star and Eric Morgan's quite a funny bloke you know and you look at I've just been writing, I was, I was telling my earlier, I've just been writing a year of stories for my grandsons just to tell them about my life and what, and I try to make this point again and again. You look, when we lose one of the great comedians, Eric, uh, Tommy Cooper, Ronnie C, Rick, every front page the next day, every single yeah. front page of the Nationals, from the Financial Times to the Star, picture of Rick. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't even happen, I don't think. I mean, maybe more in these more tabloidy days, but... They are the warp and fabric of our lives. Only music does does a similar thing. I mean, for me, Bob Dylan or Leonard Cohen or the Stones, or, they're part of what I am and what I live. I think of parts of my life, they were driven by that music and by that comedy. And through my life, comedy stood up for things that I think are important. I said, no, that's not right. We're not going to do that. Not, not, not just comic relief in a very obvious way. But they've said, hang on, you're talking bollocks. And what worries me at the moment, what really worries me about the world today, and this is not an anti-woke, anti-old man rape. What worries me at the moment is we're being told what to think. We're being told what we can, what's good and what's bad. We have got what must be the worst administration in my living memory, and I'm over 70 years old, fucking up the country. Mm -hmm. And who would want to deal with COVID? I, I don't particularly want Keir Starmer dealing with it either. But these people have lied, have cheated, have given jobs to mates, have tried yeah. to get round the rules. It's a disgrace what's happening in this country. Mm -hmm. And it's not that the BBC now cancel the, the MASH report. The MASH report wasn't doing enough. To, where is Peter Cook? Mm -hmm. Where is uh, Rick doing Alan Bastard? Where are the people saying, fuck off, this is wrong. Yeah, yeah. what's yeah. happened? Is what's lost happened here? Yeah. And we're not getting enough of it. We're not getting enough young people mm. saying, whoa, hang on, I can't read To Kill a Mockingbird? Mm. Who the fuck are you to tell me I can't read a Mockingbird? It makes me so angry. And I look at these two little three-year-old boys and I think to myself, and I've said to them in the book, don't ever let anybody tell you what you can read, where you can live, what your job is, who you can love. Don't let anybody tell you that without they explain to you what their locus is and what they're... Mm -hmm. And comedy is the voice that has to stand up and say that. And that's why it's important. So if I, given how important it is, I was lucky enough to be in a position where I was bringing it, you know, mitigating, as Bill said, between the talent thing. Yeah. And so that becomes important because comedy is important. Sure, but look, I don't want to get into too much about it, but... There's been times throughout all of our lives, I want to speak like we, we just had a horrible day or something, and mm. these silly moments that are on VHS, you put it, it's completely comforting, can turn around totally. the dark. It, totally. It's so important, and it's not thought of enough as important. It just, well, we can't thank you, you enough. It, for it unifies Barlow. people, doesn't it? It's unified all of us as well. Gary Barlow and... talks very movingly about his downest moment when he was driving somewhere, and, and a song came on the radio, yeah. and, and it changed. His life turned around at that moment because for him it, it's music. And for me it's comedy and you're so right. You know, how many people are saved from, I mean, you know, we all live lives of quiet, de quiet desperation, but or a lot of us do. Um, but how many people are saved from their darkest moment mm -hmm. or their darkest hour? How many people's best friends are actually the comic performers or the musicians that 
inspire them in their in their mm. sometimes quite contained worlds. It's a really important function in society, and that's why the kind of woke mantra stuff gets on my tits because it's don't you tell me what I can't make jokes about. Now we've just mm. been talking about making jokes about Hitler, and you know I understand mm. the argument, but Charlie Chaplin, the producers, you know you can do it. Mm. Don't tell me I can't make a joke about this or that or the other because I'm telling you I can and I will and I have the right to. And it's important I do. Yeah. Comedy is as an, an important part of our art and our culture as any of the million pound paintings hanging in a museum. It, as an important part of our culture mm. as, a, as great theatre, as great mm. drama, as great movies, as great writing, books. It's integral. And if you didn't have comedy, I don't think the human race would, mm. e would exist anymore. And we thank you for everything you've done for it hey well thank, thank you. you it's been a fascinating afternoon i mean i can't thank believe i've been about five hours <laughs> it's been fascinating so um, thank you thank you paul it's um, been an absolute pleasure